My name is Monk Rowe for the Phileas Jazz Archive at Hamilton College. I'm very pleased to have David Weiss with me today, who is a composer, arranger, band leader, and according to Jazz Times, a man who has a righteous trumpet chops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that goes back a ways. A, a oh, review. So maybe, they're, maybe they're not so righteous anymore. Who well, knows? I'm just... I, I'm wondering if you're able to keep your trumpet chops up in this during these almost two years of COVID now. Um, it's been interesting. It's been interesting. Um, yes and no. I mean, it's been two years. <laughs> it's, um, and there's been a lot of up and downs. And there's been things in my, my personal life that I let take everything over because, I mean, what else was there to do? Um, my mother passed away a little over two years ago. The house we grew up in in Queens is a big house and, um, it took months and months to clean it out. Um, so with no gigs, <laughs> no, um, I let, I let that other stuff take over, you know, in the last few months, but other times I went away for a while, um, was able to practice more than I had practiced in years. Um, right after that low point of not playing at all for the first time in my life for like three or four months, I think it was. Um, then I was able to go somewhere and basically have a place to play all the time and practice more than I had for seven weeks. Um, what do you that, tend to, what, excuse me, what do you tend uh, to practice? Um, it's an interesting thing. This is what me and actually other guys in the cookers were talking about at the beginning of the pandemic. When you're playing a lot, ideally, um, with trumpet, you're basically trying to do maintenance, you know, like, like an athlete, you know, you still, you know, you still go to the gym, you still do weight training, whatever it is to keep you in the best shape you can be to, to do this, do this thing. So that includes physical stuff. And I mean, trumpet stuff is kind of calisthenic. -y. I mean, you do a lot of long tones, do a lot of slurs, you do a lot of things just to kind of maintain whatever it is you you've achieved at that point. Um, and the thing about the pandemic was, okay, you know, we all had that like, oh, wow, now, well, at least we'll have this time to, <laughs> you know, that not exactly a desert island or a cabin in the woods, but you have suddenly you're like, wow, I, this is going to be great. I'm going to have all the time in the world to practice. Um, but what we found after like those guys longer than me, but, you know, me for a considerable amount of time too, we found like, oh, wow, we, we can go past maintenance. You know, we can actually start working on our craft again, like improving, you know, and it, it took a minute to be like, oh, yeah, how did how did we do that? <laughs> you know? So um, I went back, I went back to, to basics. I started transcribing solos again. I started doing more, you know, expanding the the, the calisthenic, calisthenics and stuff that would, you know, probably, you know, either try and like improve my range or, or you know, make me more consistent. Um, so I was able to work out, you know, instead of like the one hour, keep your chops together to two hours, you know, kind of strengthen a little more to the three or four hours, like, you know, let's go for something <laughs> that will actually make you, you know, exceed what you've done so far. When, uh, when you finally got back together with any of your ensembles, did you notice a positive difference with most of your fellow musicians because of I, what you're describing? I, I don't have the full gamut yet because I haven't, I really haven't gotten together with anybody but the cookers. Um, one thing COVID has done is the casual get together, I guess. I mean, why have a jam session if you got to put people at risk or, you know, something. So, I mean, I've always been a bit of a hermit, so I've, I've stayed in. I haven't I haven't done anything with any other bands but the Cookers, so I can only relate to them. Um, and that was an interesting phenomenon. You're talking about guys that have gone at like a break, breakneck pace for 50 years that suddenly had to stop and be like, okay, what am I doing? Um, and we go, when we got back together, we were a little sloppy, but everybody, nobody lost anything. I mean, you know, you wouldn't think 
four or five. I think the first time we got together, um, when did this all really start? So we were on tour in, in March of 2020. I mean, February of 2020. And we finished like March 1st. And then two weeks, less than two weeks later, we were about to do a long European tour, like two or three week tour, maybe not that long. Um, um, a couple of guys already had gigs over there and had gone to Europe. And then it was a big thing when things shut down to get them back home from Europe. Um, we all stayed in touch, you know, and had those conversations like, well, what are you doing? Um, but by that summer, by July, you know, the first that first crazy wave in New York was dying down. Things were opening up a little bit. It was possible to do things. And I don't know if it was something I sensed or maybe something in me, but it seemed like we needed to get together I, that everybody just needed to do something to get get back on track and play some music um on that tour in march of 2020 we were going to do a live album we were we were preparing to do a live album record probably record in london um so we had a label that wanted to do a record and i just said look we're gonna i'm gonna try to do this where we control the situation you know we went to rudy van gelder's a because it's a great studio and b it's a standalone property. People can just drive up <laughs> to the door and go in. And, you know, so we I talked to everybody. Everybody was way into it. I just said, okay, we all got to get tested. I guess the NBA bubble inspired me, you know, everybody got tested and they threw them all together and they were able to do their thing for months. I just needed a few, you know, a few days. So we went upstate to a club I knew up there. It was pretty large and comfortable and not open and they let us use the place we went up there for a couple of days and rehearsed um and like you said every everywhere i was trying to do is like out of the city <laughs> where people can just drive up to the place drive out, not not be on a subway not be in a building or an elevator nothing that would like put anybody in potential harm's way um so we got upstate and you know we rehearsed a little bit and it was Part of it was it was hard to tell like the difference because it was so it was so relaxed i mean nobody had anywhere to go <laughs> you know we had all the time in the world nobody was bothering anybody nobody had a teaching obligation nobody had another gig so i mean it wasn't like a i, I wish it could have been longer but it was just just a couple of days up there and then um i think we had planned to do one gig because one place was opening up but in the end we didn't do it so we just rehearsed a little more and we went into van gelder's it was the same thing. No rush. Nobody had to be anywhere. Big studio. Um, we were, you know, like I said, we were all tested. So it, it was nice to have that time. And that balanced the fact that, okay, maybe we were, you know, all the passion was there. All, all the things that make those guys great was there, but maybe we were a little sloppier here and there. Um, but we had time to like, okay, let's do it again. You know, I mean, I understand I, I, that, sorry, go ahead. I, I understand the group came out of, um, uh, Freddie Hubbard connection, but I wonder if some point did you feel not intimidated isn't the right word. Was it a bit odd for you to be the head of a group where the majority of the players were anywhere from 20 to almost 30 years older than you? Now, you had established yourself certainly as a presence in New York and, you know, had, had your due respect. But still, I'm wondering if any of this has been odd for you to sort of be in charge of musicians of that pedigree. Well, I think, well, there's many things I could say about that. Um, I did work with Freddie Hubbard for eight years before, I guess they, they kind of overlapped a little bit. And the first night of the cookers gig or the first attempt at it was something they asked me to put together because of my connection with Freddie. The guy wanted Freddie to come and like be the MC, you know, and be, be the birth, you know, the night of the cookers concert, I don't remember the exact dates, but they are right around Freddie's birthday. And there was this club in Brooklyn where the guys first, concert when he was a kid was the night of the cookers concert um so he was always enamored with it. and every year he would try to do something like try to get freddie to come in but freddie lived in california and he didn't have a very big club so it was kind of a challenge to get freddie to come in to blow out some birthday cake and one year he finally said like well i want to put together a night of the cookers reunion i want freddie to come but i want all the other guys there so we got pete larocca and james spaulding 
uh, we tried to get Harold Mayburn, but he wasn't available. And Larry Ridley did it. And when, you know, when Mayburn couldn't do it, we decided like to put together some more Freddie Hubbard alumni. Ronnie Matthews did it, and Keanu Zawadi did it. And that concert was an, a success. And that's that's what, and Pete LaRocca and James Spaulding were great. And that's what started it. It morphed into what the cookers are today, but it started as this night of the cookers celebration that people reached out to me because at the time I was working with Freddie and, you know, hope they thought I can help get them to do something Freddie didn't really want to do, which was come fly to New York, blow out a birthday cake. Um, so as far, I don't consider myself the leader. That's, that's one thing. I mean, I'll get, I try to get the gigs, I coordinate stuff, I match up, but in the rehearsal, it's not like, <clears throat> look, Billy, <laughs> you're going to have to, you know, it's, ne it's, I mean, there is maybe a little bit of a straw bust thing where I'm like, okay, let's play this tune. Oh yeah. Well, that didn't really sound, let's try that again. It's never like, you know, you, you really need to, you know, so, and those guys know it. I mean, they'll mess with me sometimes. Billy Hart very early on was like, look, man, we just don't do this for anybody. You know, David, I mean, and their elders did that to them. There was this thing was always uh, like, look, this is a small club and we don't let anybody, just anybody. And you can't just walk in here and do this. You got to, you know, bring something to the table. And I've always felt that pressure. I, you know, I started on, on jazz late. So I always felt I was behind the curve. Um, I always felt I was trying to catch up with everybody. And this, in a way, is putting me in a situation where I'm still doing that. You know, I don't see. Have, have they yeah. ever talked about um, back in the earlier parts of their career? I think critics and authors sometimes like to make an issue of race in jazz. And I'm wondering if you hear that from these musicians. I hear, I hear stuff about how they're treated. I, you know, I don't think it's in jazz. I think it's in the world they lived in. Like Billy Harper went to North Texas State, and so did I. So one of our first conversations was like, well, you know, well, North Texas State, it was a little different for a little Jewish boy from from Queens. Um, and then he told me his story, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> and never, you know. I couldn't live on campus. I had to live in a little shack on the other side of the tracks and I had to walk two miles to school. And finally, by the third year, they let me live on campus, but like it was a janitor's closet. You know, they tried to make me, you know, they found a place for me because I made the one, you know, I was like, oh, whoa, <laughs> okay, I get it. You know, somebody going like, you're Jewish, but didn't, wasn't exactly comparable. Yeah, so, he, I he, mean, the life, he, you know, so the life is, the, the life. I mean, we're talking about our lives and stuff like that. It's no, I mean, see something B told me once when he was a little kid, he just tried to make a couple of pennies shining shoes and a couple of cowboys came and pick them up and threw them in a trash can. You know, I mean, there's so much stuff, you know, that informs who they are. It's not a barrage of that, but if we're, you know, we're on a long train ride and people are talking about their lives. Those that's part of their life. I have nothing comparable you know um but i seem to be able to <laughs> relate to their world philosophy in a, a lot of ways i mean it's kind of like this knowing seeing it all you know but have found a way <laughs> to a sort of find the beauty and <laughs> be you know be pretty very practical about things and not you know I, i'll tend to get more caught up in little things because well, let's say um, privilege maybe i don't know um but it's it's never a, a a thing you know they they're very nice to me <laughs> you know i think you know in the end people are people there are there are differences but i mean you know i think at this point i didn't have to prove it to them but you know i think they know my heart's in the right place you know nice. okay i put you know, and more more importantly, it's a musical thing. If it wasn't a good musical experience, they wouldn't do it. You know, or they would let me know. <laughs> you know, they, they they're not always on me, but you know, sometimes after a gig, I can be walking off the stage after the last tune, and Billy Hart can say like, "Oh, you, you took one course too many on that one, didn't you?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I did." <laughs> you know, 
the lessons are always there or the opposite you know george cables after a gig once i remember man you showed me something you know you showed me something on that left you know so it's not a constant thing you know but it's you know i'm, I'm, I'm always told. Sort of, <laughs> i'm fascinated by the the connections between jazz and what's going on in society do you feel that those musicians that were young men in the 60s, do you have a sense that their music was significantly affected by the turbulence of the 60s? I think I think the, the old adage is, you know, oh, I, <laughs> and I forgot it. Um, something about, you know, you can't you can't play it unless you've lived it or something like that. Or, you know, if you haven't experienced it, it can't come out of your horn. Um, I, I'm i still floored by that sometimes. I could just be, <clears throat> we could be just sitting in a rehearsal and getting warmed up and Billy Harper will take the horn out of his case and go like, Woof, and I can hear 50 years, you know, in the tone. I can hear that. I can't hear that with just anybody, you know? So there's something that, was, but it's it's more than that. I mean, that is part of it, you know, clearly turbulent times stir something up in you and it comes out in your music. But also a lot of it is just the level those guys function at and the level of the people around them. You know, I think, and I think, I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing, but I think this goes to almost everybody I've dealt with in, from that era. Um, they were always scared of somebody. There was somebody walking the earth. I mean, Freddie Hubbard always told me about Lee Morgan, <laughs> you know, they, and how determined they, they all had a determination, you know, a, maybe because the stakes were higher. I mean, I can't speak to that stuff well, but I mean, if music like sports is a way out of something <laughs> um, and everybody else around you is really good, <laughs> you know, if you're walking into New York and John Coltrane's there already, what are you going to do? You know, and, and they did it. You know, I mean, I find that the level was much higher there because you couldn't, I mean, that's why it was a smaller family because not everybody can reach those levels. And there were a lot of, a lot of giants walking the earth then. But that's what you were read, walking into. I want to read something from yeah. your website regarding the cookers. It said the cookers embody the serious as death commitment that it took to thrive on the New York scene some four decades ago. <laughs> I like that. Did I say that? <laughs> I, I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think, I think it, maybe somebody put something I was trying to convey into better words than I could. Okay. You no, know, and bless, bless their little soul, whoever they were. <laughs> um, but there, I mean, there was a lot of that. I mean, at, at some point, me and Freddie, Freddie Hubbard always wanted me to publish the charts that I wrote of his music. And I said, that's a great idea, Freddie, and I'm happy to do that. But do you know what would really make an impact and sell a lot of books and, you know, help the world? It's a, a Freddie Hubbard trumpet method book. And we sat down and we did a bunch of interviews. And at the end of it, it was all a lot of fun. And I learned a little bit. Um, but at the end, he's like, what do you I was like, well, I think I could write this book in one in one paragraph. You had a you had a ton of natural talent and you tried harder than everybody else. You practiced harder. You were more dedicated and more determined than anybody else I ever knew. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What and, and what else? <laughs> you know, try playing this. Um, but that's that's the essence I got from it. And a lot of it was a competitive nature, I think. And I mean, I also got that from like reading some Sonny Rollins stuff and, discuss and discussions with Freddie about Sonny Rollins. Um, Freddie got to New York. And that, this is the other thing I can, I mean, sometimes when we're sitting somewhere waiting, the stories, I mean, Billy Harper's story of trying to sit in with Elvin Jones <laughs> is painful. <laughs> Cause they just didn't let anybody do, you know, you know, you want to be part of this, you know, go sit over there. You know, Freddie Hubbard told me that, you know, first time he went to a jam session in the Bronx, they're like, who are you? Go sit over there and wait. And then the night, oh, we forgot all of, oh, come back tomorrow. What are you doing here? 
go sit over there, <laughs> you know? Um, and that kind of stuff drove him. I mean, you know, he was, he was determined and, and, and that's what I see. I mean, not only all the immense talent and all the immense work, but, but a drive, like, you know, nobody's going <laughs> to tell me to sit over there again, <laughs> you know? You're, you're um, making me think of a, a quote I happen to have here. I want your reaction to it. This was from a recent discussion I had with a, a fairly well-known jazz author and arts administrator. And he said, this generation of jazz musicians has more technique, knows more theory and more history than any other, yet you almost can't tell them apart. I find it also odd that with these musicians, again, more technically adept, theoretically sound than any other generation, we haven't had an overriding genius appear since John Coltrane, who died in 1967. Maybe there's a couple past Coltrane, and I'm sure if you open up a magazine today, somebody's going to be called a genius. But I, I understand the sentiment of that. I don't know if I totally agree with it. Um, I don't know how to put it exactly. I'm not sure they have more technique. Maybe as a generalization, maybe from one to 50, they've all learned something. But I mean, I've definitely had rehearsals with guys out of school that really couldn't read the parts quickly, really couldn't, you know, sh you know, they hit walls. I, I think they get to a certain level very quickly, especially younger guys. I think younger guys get, get, get to a place very fast, but I think they hit a wall and whatever's past that wall is what all those other guys did. I don't think, I don't think the environment is right for that. I, I, I definitely have dealt with a lot of younger musicians who think they went to school and got an A and, and came to New York to make it and think they've arrived. I don't, I don't think it's even within their the scope of what they think they have to do that there's that much more to do. Like you just got, you just got started, not you just finished your studies. Um, so I think a lot of that I run into, but there's exceptions. I mean, there's some, you know, but it's going to be interesting to see how far they go. Um, some, some are, some are great. Um, and also another thing is, I mean, most are having longer careers than any of those guys ever did. Um, I remember once I was doing something for Blue Note Records and we were discussing the young artists they had just signed and maybe put out their first record or second record and it wasn't really had they weren't stars it wasn't really they didn't blow up it's not really happening for them and i said well maybe not everybody gets it by the time they're 23 24. the irony is you'll probably let this guy make three records and by the time he makes his fourth record and figure things out you've dropped him <laughs> you know so you know so these guys are about... healthier and they have longer careers yeah. but i don't i mean it it's What's going on here, basically, I don't I don't like to, 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 to distill things down to a basic thing, but it might not be that off. Um, you have guys that are going to school and learning a language and learning that language well. Bebop is that that harmony. That, 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 that's a challenge. Um, but once you master that, then what? Or once you get to a certain point, like you see the best guys who do that kind of thing essentially make the same record for 20 years. I mean, there's a little growth. They're always going to get better, but, and I'm not saying this, I don't, I don't think this art form is limiting, but it seems like they've put it in a box kind of like ding, ding, a ding. It's supposed to swing. It's supposed to feel good, but all the urgency of the sixties and those guys. And, and the reason is a certain urgency to it is because they were, you know, they were trying things new and they were changing things all the time. Um, and now you guys got people studying that and kind of basically stopping in 1962 or something. And then you got the guys that are trying to push things forward within that realm, but there's not a ton of them. And then on the other side, you have all the avant-garde stuff. They don't have all that history. Some do, but they don't really have that. But they're trying stuff at least. But do they have me, the his 
I'm sorry, do they have the history of Ben Webster and before him? Well, that, that's an interesting that you chose Ben Webster because, I mean, again, anytime we talk this way, we generalize and I'm going to get killed on something. But a lot of the avant-garde guys, as far as us, you know, swing, whatever, how we always analyze, I mean, somebody analyzed it better than me and said, hey, they just skipped Bebop. You know? Who skipped um, Bebop? Who skipped like the, more, the more avant-garde guys, if you see, they're doing tributes to Lester, you know, Lester Bowie. Now, Lester Bowie does Louis Armstrong. They come, I mean, they skip Bebop. <laughs> they took all the wonderful things about swing and that expressiveness and all, all the stuff those guys did, and they kind of continue on from there. That's where they found their more emotional truth or their melodic sense or whatever it is they're trying to do. I mean, that's that one school of avant-garde, and it is the ones that are like the amazing composers, the, the ones that really interest me personally for what I come out of, like the Henry Threadgills and Muhol Richard Abrams, these guys who at least wrote incredible music, you know, when it comes time to soloing, you know, but, but those are the guys that are writing the most interesting music I'm hearing over, over my career, the last 20, 30 years. Henry Threadgill, Muhol Richard Abrams, I'm trying to think of who else, there's gotta be more than those. Um, but that's, that's growth by like, but those guys come out of another thing. And they also come out of a, a, a classical thing. And I, I mean, I've, Henry Thurgood lives around the corner. I mean, talk to him all the time. He's a Chicago guy. He talks about Gene Ammons all the time. You know, they, they know the music. Um, so you're in this thing like, okay, I'm trying to do something more based in this, you know, more advanced harmony, hopefully swing based, whatever in that realm um but i want the adventurous spirit of these guys you know to keep looking that's what i like that's what the cookers i think grabs those guys came through everything or well versed in everything and have always tried to push it a little forward if you want to call it like the spiritual thing of the 70s or the more free thing of the 70s or whatever whatever but whatever they've done is informed by you know George Cables with Dexter Gordon, <laughs> you know, uh, Billy Harper with Max Roach, you, you know, they came up through this stuff, but it never was, was a limiting thing to them. You know, it was always this over. And then Freddie Hubbard, that's what he told me all the time. It's like, man, we, we tried stuff all the time. We never stopped trying things, you know? I think sometimes better, those guys were so good, they didn't miss as much. So it wasn't a, a, a parent, you know? Do you or think they, that... missed, they missed better. I mean, Billy Hart used to tell me, some drummer used to tell him, you recover better than anybody. He didn't know how to really take that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, left-handed, I guess. Okay, um, but also true. I mean, that's another thing about the cookers. We played together enough. We know when somebody's kind of going out on a, a limb a little bit, and they got your back. You know, they're not going to let you, you know, they're not going to let you crash and burn unless they're mad at you or something. Okay. Um, but that you, kind of that kind of trust goes a, a long way. When you look at the arts, uh, music and uh, visual arts especially, sometimes I wonder if it gets harder to innovate. What do you do that's beyond Coltrane's ascension or any number of examples of how the limits of the art was pushed? How do you go beyond that and and still create something that people might accept. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds like a problem. Um, well, you can put it in a different way. I'd be happy if you did. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm half kidding, but I'm half kind of acknowledging. I think what happens is I don't think anybody really tried to be an innovator. I think... I think a lot of it was just natural growth. And the, and the interesting thing is um, a friend I work with came back from Banff. It's, I, I went to Banff right out of college. It's, a, it's just a jazz workshop in the Canadian Rockies. When I went there, Dave Holland was running the program. So coming out of North Texas State, kind of, you know, I needed to loosen up a little bit, let's say. 
and went there. And that's actually where I, you know, Muhal Richard Abrams was the the guest conductor, and we we played, you know, we did a concert with him playing his music. Um, but uh, Dave Holland ran it. Dave Liebman and Richie Byrack were there. George Lewis, I don't know if you know him, the avant garde trombone player. He was there. Um, John Abercrombie was there. I'm trying to think of who else. Kenny Wheeler was there. Um, guys, you know, that were pretty much rooted in stuff, but also trying to be, you know, I think it's just an approach and what happens, happens. I think nobody can sit there and go like, oh, well, it's time to change music today. Um, but it's definitely an approach. Again, I, you know, I go back to the cookers because there's not, not many examples. Those guys are playing. I mean, you know, I'll recognize things they played from another time and uh, I'm definitely guilty of it. But they're always pushing something. They're always trying something. You know, it's just an approach. And the approach is the most important thing. You know, not never stand, you know, staying pat, you know, just, you know, always, always pushing things, something, you know, just everything seems fresh with them. You know, there's no, no, I mean, there might be a routine within it. I mean, on this material, um, we've definitely, I mean, to put it in, <laughs> I can't, I, it's not the right way to put it. It's actually the most wrong way I could put it. They've developed routines. I mean, that's not the word I want to use when I'm talking about openness and, and freedom and stuff, but they've developed stuff within the tune. But really what they're doing is using it as a launching pad to go somewhere. Um, so, I mean, it was an interesting conversation I had with Billy Hart. We had done two records. Billy more than once to tell me like, you know what, these are, two very good records. I like these, these, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't say that often, but I like these two. And I called them up and said, Hey, you know, we got a, got an offer to do a third record. And he said, why? And I was like, well, because I, we do this for a living and <laughs> you know, we make, keep making records. And what he meant was we found the material that we need to do what we do. Why, why do more? I was like, well, you never know. We might find a couple more and we definitely have, but the conversation went to, okay, why did Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter, Herbie, Ron and Tony, why did they play Autumn Leaves every night when they were recording ESP? You know, why were they, you know, why was their set? I mean, as far as the material they chose, basically the same every night for three you know and over the three years they added a few things but for the most part they're playing footprints i mean they added some newer tunes they added footprints and they added agitation but they still played around midnight um and they, they had a set and, and he was like why do you think those guys played those tunes all the time and it was like because they knew that they could do anything on them they were launching pads for them to do their thing you know, and you can listen to five Miles Davis concerts in a row and those tunes are different every time. You know, what Herbie, Ron and Tony did was never pat <laughs> and was challenging every night and they challenged each other every night and they did everything. I mean, I mean, they're the penultimate rhythm section, but that point is clear. I mean, you know, you make new records for new materials, <laughs> fans have, you know, but you find the stuff to do live that give is the launching point for you to continue, you know, continue to do what you do, or that gives you the openness to, to, to try that thing. And you know, the thing. So if you miss, <laughs> you can get back, you know, get back on track. So, and we've continued that. I mean, you know, we do rec new records all the time. And those tunes, some of those tunes always make their way into the book. Some make their way into the book for a while and go away when something else comes along. But there's still three or four staples that we basically have done almost from the beginning until something comes along that displaces it. Um, and it's not like, oh, we're playing that tune again. It's like, okay, well, what, well, what are we going to do with that tune tonight? Mm -hmm. You know, what's nice. what's going to happen? You know, and there's not, and there's no talk of like, well, let's let's do something innovative on that tune tonight. You know, it's whatever grows out of our experience of playing together and doing this stuff, and everybody knowing each other well enough to be like, you know. What, Go ahead, you know. So things can happen, um, and I've oh, I've always tried to have bands that do that. Um, 
and you you know you miss more you know you take more chances but when it works i mean miles missed <laughs> he missed bad but it's the same thing with herbie ron and tony they i can hear them now that i know the material i can hear when they miss things but they're just so much better at it you can't <laughs> you know you can't really detect it but i mean it's it's really all i mean what i've found is it's really all about approach i mean yeah, yeah i want to sit down and write a lot of great music but how it's played on the bandstand it, it's really all about approach and, and you know the person's you know approach to the music yeah and that's why i mean i stick with those guys because they're great but they also teach me that every night and i'm 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 the one that's maybe more locked into a certain thing by what i play um but they'll push me towards that like you know i don't want to say call it like, like like say i play a certain tune and i like a certain phrase over it or something um i only seemingly play it when i don't have when i when everything's not connected you know it's like something like a fallback it's or or it's something like to just get started and then let's see where you take me today <laughs> you know yeah. um so i mean it, it, it's a lot of it is approach the end i want to say one thing about the innovation thing so we, we we're talking about banff wow i got off on a tangent um so I went to Banff in, I don't know, right out of college, 1986, 1987. And 25 years later, a friend of mine went and BJ Iyer was, um, <clears throat> BJ Iyer was a director of the thing. And what sounded like a very kumbaya moment. I mean, you know, Banff is in the Canadian Rockies. It's, 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 it's gorgeous up there. Um, so he had everybody sit outside and introduce themselves, all the students on the first day introduce himself and, and um, tell him what your, what your goals are. Maybe your goals for your career or your goals for the, 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 um, what the, is it called? the camp, yeah. <laughs> the thing. The um, thing. Um, and, and, and my friend told me one, one kid got up and said, my name is so-and-so and I want to be an innovator. Uh -huh. And I was like, <laughs> and he laughed, he was telling me a joke, you know, like, you know, look at these, look at these kids, man. What the, you know, and uh, he's a kid. He'll grow up, he'll, he'll figure it out. But it's interesting that some people think that how that, that's how it happens. Or people who are in that, being considered in that realm, play with that realm a little bit, you know. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. But I mean, I'm going to look at it like, I don't know. Like, let's say Stanley Kubrick. He's like one of the best filmmakers we ever had. Was he an innovator? Or did he just do, I think it was a quote of him. I think his quote was, everything's been done. My job is just to do it better than everybody. You know? And that's what I mean. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft, whether innovation happens or not. It's not a goal, you know, but I'm going to strive to be the best I can whatever that means or however that manifests itself. Is somebody going to be an innovator? I don't know. Will I care? <laughs> I mean, I used to, I, somebody asked me about that a different way, not this way. This way is fun. Um, and I said, okay, well, let me ask you this. If people come go to a con if an audience goes to a concert tonight, are they going to say like, well, I really want to see some great music or are they going to say, I want to see some innovation? You know, yeah. I mean, I hope most people wipe that from their mind. I think certainly there are musicians who know how to manipulate the world they're living in. They're, they're clever, they're smart people and they're good musicians and they know how to press buttons. You know, I know people, you know, some guys who are just breaking in working with a record label like to pick the perfect combination of tunes and musicians that make it pure catnip for the general press okay let's see let's do an let's do an andrew hill tune let's do a tribe call quest tune let's you know just push every button now you still got to do it well but there's a clear path if if you think you're one of those people that are considered in that way to be like, okay, well, you know, let's continue to press those buttons. Hey, you know, so, and it works, but is it innovation? <laughs> is it even good? Is it even pure? I, 
I mean, it's always good to have goals. It's always good, you know, if you're going to do a record or a project, have a certain thing in your mind about how to go for this. And all the better if you succeeded, you know, but that's a, innovation is a, a, a tricky word. I mean, I think in more straight ahead realms, more harmony based, swing based realms, the changes are going to be more subtle. And I don't think people will hear, hear it. I mean, a lot of things that are considered innovation these days are more, you kind of hitting somebody over the head with a, you know, the, the, the changes have to be bigger for people to recognize them. Um, and I think, I think in the realm of, you know, I think Sonny Rollins spent 50 years perfecting his craft. You know, was he an innovator? I think so at the beginning, but he still kept going, <laughs> you know? Um, I think, I think it manifests itself in different ways and more, more subtle ways. You know, and the other flip, you know, if you want to go into the world you're playing in, nobody's looking for, innov for innovation in anything swing based or har harmony based. They put it in a box, it's been done already. And, you know, a lot of the music proves them right, but a lot of it doesn't, you know, and they don't, they don't you don't ever, never hear about it. I love what you're saying about this. Um, and it makes me think about rhythm sections and what they do with the time. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, in the cookers, who's the main, who's in the driver's seat as far as the rhythm? Or, or is it a shared responsibility? And the, and the reason I ask this is Cecil McBee said some very eloquent things uh, about quarter notes, about playing the bass and approaching the quarter notes. And he said to the bassists, you are the timekeeper. You are the vibe of yeah. the entire group. That's that's true. That's tr I agree with that. I mean, you know, ask James Brown. I mean, that that comes, you know, that's a fact in a lot of music. The drummer seemingly is the guy, but because um, he's a little more, you know, <laughs> easy to focus on him. Plus with the fills and everything, there's more going on with the drummer. But the drummer can't do that without the foundation from a bass player. Um, and I found interesting a lot, and this is not, I mean, you mentioned Cecil, but this has got, this has got nothing to do with Cecil. What I have found over the years talking to various drummers is their taste in bass players is different than mine or most people. Um, guys, I think like uh, um, Dwayne Berno is my guy. Like he's a little younger than me, but I'm gonna say my generation. He was in all the bands I did in their inception, my octet and my sextet. He was the guy. He was the guy who took the Ron Carter stuff and made made it a language and did the stuff that Ron did, which is rare. Guys who are able to do make do substitutions and do all that stuff and make. I mean, I can play records. Um, we did this. Uh, this is a, like mini big band album of Wayne Shorter material, and I can point to parts in the arrangement where Dwayne made it better on the fly. Just he knew the music he knew where everything was coming from and he knew where it's he understood what you were trying to do and he knew how to take it somewhere and i could point to it and like i owe him ten dollars for that because i didn't write that like in a solely section or something with the horns he i was like okay <laughs> i've even told him sometimes i've come to him and been like okay doing <laughs> here here you go <laughs> you, know, you may you owe you owe a piece of that um but that said i was shocked when drummers you know, drummers, generations before me, <laughs> who came out of came out of that music that influenced Dwayne, didn't like playing with Dwayne. Many did, but some didn't. Like, no, no, they get get this guy, and that guy was just, you know, because they wanted that to play off that. If Dwayne is busy doing, you know, what are they doing? One of them even said that. Like, what am I gonna do? You know, and they want to they want to play with the time as opposed they want to the foundation playing. and they want to be able to. Da, da, da. Yeah. Even if they're not playing with the time, per se, or even the fills or whatever, they want the foundation for them to do their thing. 
And that's a big ask, <laughs> I think. So, but it's an interesting phenomenon because what basically Cecil's basically saying is even though I do all that other stuff, you know, I do this because this is what this is what works in that situation. You know, the Cecil could be all over the place, <laughs> but he can also just be, you know, if that's what the material calls for, you know, he does it. So that's, I mean, and that's another thing I love about those guys. I like these guys um, is they've all, and I've said this often, they've all been in the, in the greatest bands that this music has shown. You know, I used to, there was one tour where the record came out and we were on a good tour too. And it was in June and it was like the basketball playoffs. And um, I kept using the San Antonio Spurs analogy because they were, they were older, they were older team, but they were a team and they played well together. And I was like, see, the Spurs, we're the Spurs. <laughs> see, they're all great players, but they all know roles. They don't play the role all the time, but they know how to make a great band. They've been a component in a great band. That doesn't just happen. You got to, you know, I don't want to say you got to know your play, you know, you have a role. You can still be the best musician you can be and play a role. It doesn't have to be a restricting thing. And it makes the band the band. I mean, Cecil knows that from Charles Lloyd with Jack Desjardins and Keith Jarrett. You know, Eddie Henderson and Billy Hart know that from M. Wondishi with Herbie Hancock. Though they they, they basically said, look, Herbie just made everything sound great. But, uh, um, you know, so those were great bands. They were all like in, you know, bought into the system. I mean, you know, certainly there was, I don't want to say controversy there, you know, there's some ruffled feathers here and there, but they all bought into the band, you know, we're a band and, and you don't really see that mentality too much anymore. You know, you see clicks maybe, but I don't know if you see bands that much. I mean, Jason Moran has kept his band together for a long time and, and, you know, it's admirable and it, you know, it's certainly paid off. Those guys are great. Um, and some guy, like young guys, Emmanuel Wilkins has kept his band together for a couple of years now, and he's he's you know starting to get out there and play. I don't think he'll be an in it, <laughs> but he's going to do some really interesting stuff. He's going to keep things fresh. You know, I'll go. I'm going to go with fresh. I, I like fresh. Fresh, okay. Yeah. Fresh is good. In your career, right. uh, you've a, you seems to be a constant um, balancing and juggling of tasks that you've learned you can do and i wonder if some patron happened to drop in the scene and said i'm going to finance let's say the cookers for a year that's all i want you to do you you this group is so important i'm going to finance the whole thing for a solid year do you think you would have trouble doing that and giving up all the other things that you do? Well, I mean, as I kind of said, I mean, it's a, the question has a different meaning now, interestingly. A, like I said, the pandemic um, has kind of eliminated everything else. I haven't been doing it. I mean, I've been doing some things at home. I've I've known about some of this music before, but I've discovered some things. There's an interesting period. I mean, this is like the historical part of me, um, which is fun. And this is the kind of thing, like if things were normal, I'd be like, okay, let me get this somewhere and try it. But apparently, I mean, I sort of knew some of this. I know it better now. Apparently in 1967, <clears throat> Art Blakey hired Slide Hampton for the messengers and to be, and be the music director. And Slide wrote a bunch of music, sex like sex type charts, and they're great. And they've never been officially recorded. You can see boot, you see some bootlegs of it. There's a, a recording from RCA Studios, George Ween's birthday party, where Art Blakey's band plays a set, and they're in RCA Studios, so they pressed record, and it's just sitting there. Nobody knows about it. No, you know. But I got in my capacity of other work, I got to hear it. And it's all Slide Hampton charts. And his videos from 1968, the slide's not even in the band, but they're playing all of Slide's material. 
And there's sextet charts and I'm enamored with sextet charts. I got cut my teeth on learning how to write. And those Wayne Shorter sextet charts and all that stuff. Um, and they're great. And I'm gonna I'm gonna transcribe I've been transcribing them and I'll do them eventually, but I can wait a year <laughs> to do this. I mean, the timing is now it feels like I'm almost just focusing on the cookers now, you know, because when things are a little uncertain, things are not opening up. I mean, honestly, to give the David Weiss a sex sextet a gig now when things are like you know you're not sure people are coming out or whatever i'm you know I'm, i think i'm a tough sell <laughs> right now mm. you know when things are more open up and things are functioning normally and everybody's has full schedules you know but right now i'm focusing on the cooking and also i mean if two years off or you know well it hasn't been two years off a year off you know shows you anything you know and nobody's a baby and you know it's you know i don't want to be like strike while the iron's hot but you know Let's let's play while everybody is, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I've often and I can been do asked... it, but there's an urgency. I don't. I, maybe I'm the one that's going to get hit by a bus and be the one. Okay. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't but... call it urgency, but there is a sense there that you know, hey, you know, we're not going to do this for another ten years. Yeah. When I get asked to define hard bop, it's hard. So. Do you have a definition of hard bop that I could borrow from you and I, I'll give you credit? Not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here, I'll put it aside. So what the what thing that was going around for a while was they asked Wayne Shorter what jazz is, and Wayne said, jazz means I dare you. And I like that because that's he's right. Um, but when I hear hard bop, to me, if somebody's telling me I'm hard bop, they're telling me to go fuck myself you know so it's not a good word for us hard bop to me is a way to pigeonhole the cookers into 1960 whatever you know or or me as a musician i i remember i do this band called point of departure it's it's kids it's guitars i mean it's jazz material in it but it it, it, it doesn't swing it it's it grooves it, it, you know i hope it grooves it grooves you know it's it's more of my rock and roll childhood than anything else and when the kids, when we finished the record, the guys were like, oh, you know, who's going to do, you know, we're going to go play rock clubs. And I was like, I'll bet you right now that out of 10 reviews of the record, nine of them will say hard bop trumpet or David Weiss or hard bop material or hard bop this. So, yeah, hard, hard bop means, you know, you're dead, <laughs> you know, it should be an apt description of something, but considering the mentality of the industry we're in, they're basically saying we're not interested or you're, you can not possibly hear anything innovative here. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not going to put this on NPR, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's to me, I mean, I could be sensitive. I could be off base, but to me, it's, a, it's become a dismissive term for what we do now. I'm a little confused. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is bop from a historical standpoint and from a an art form is hard bop less a respected no, no genre, I wouldn't genre? Call it that. okay i wouldn't call it that no i don't think that's the issue i think basically any bebop i think any of those forms that if anybody's trying to do them now you know they're you're playing a dead music where there's no possible room for innovation you know there's nowhere to take it in a lot of people's lives. And like I said, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. But if you do it and you're hopefully keeping it like a little more open-ended and open-minded and a little more free and, you know, have a, have a spirit there and do all that stuff. They're not really talking about that. They just say like hard bop, you know? So I find it, I find it a dismissive term just in my own personal frustration about how, this music, you know, when you put this music out here, how it's addressed. And it's true. I mean, you know, this last record did a lot of good. And I don't want to like, I don't want to complain. <laughs> I really don't want to complain. But the cookers up till this record were never in the New York Times, were never on NPR, were never featured in any jazz met publication. This downbeat cover we just did is the first time we've been in a, on a cover of a magazine. It's the first time there's even been a feature about the band 
in any of these magazines. Um, uh, um, they got oh we the down we won the downbeats critics poll as a rising star small group, and they did a little, they wrote a little blurb about it when we won, but not a not a feature. So I guess that's in a way saying well some people acknowledge you're good, but the way the jazz industry is and how what we push and what we put out there is like what's going on today you're dead. <laughs> this is a demographic. Partly a demographic thing to, if you put on the cover of Downbeat, let's say everyone in the band is seasoned <laughs> veterans, <laughs> and uh, the magazine is trying to get younger readership. Cool. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I had, it wasn't this kind of conversation today, but I remember within 10 years, um, I was, I mean, you know, I talked to the guy at down before, uh, the editor, uh, Jason Kransky, and we were talking, it was some, I forgot what it was. We were joking about something. Um, but in that kind of realm, like, you know, um, and he said the best selling magazine we had this year with Ahmad Jamal was on the cover. So I don't know. And I think maybe jazz times tries to skew younger maybe not i mean yes there's this world out here um and i'm not saying look at us we're giants just talk about us i'm just saying be inclusive we're part of this you know but be inclusive in all ways not just like european jazz festivals like yeah well we only want robert glasper and that kind we only want what the kids want we only want what's current and hip and hot da, 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 da. you know and that's that's great too but the ones that work for us are the ones that do that and do us mm -hmm. you know because you know i don't you know again i don't want to get into like the merits of the band per se but you know i'm happy with inclusion okay you know like give it give me the whole picture of jazz of like what's available out there now do i really want to hear a whole festival of just 20 somethings you know, and maybe one like a Joshua Redmond or the, the, you know, so, I mean, it's a, it's a music industry. It's a, um, and it's major labels involved now. It's just not a, not a bunch of independent labels. You know, it's not Blue Note Prestige. These are corporations. They, so the pop mentality seeps into the jazz part of their jazz division of the thing. They want, yeah, they want new, they want young, they want hot. They want to like pump them out and see if, if, they take off, you know, and they run with it. I mean, maybe the success the level of success is different than a pop artist, but you know, I think it's great. The, the Robert Glass visit the world or the, the Micaiah McCraven or who else is going to Kamasi Washington. I think it's great that that stuff's out there, but I mean, it's just not the only stuff. Okay. Um, and with Kamasi Washington, you're like, well, I mean, here's the living embodiment of everything he's trying to do. If you listen to Kamasi Washington's first record and hear all those voices and stuff like that, that's right off Billy Harper's first record. You know, and it's a Billy Harper, Pharoah Saunders, and, and a little Coltrane. I mean, you know, he brought back 70s spiritual jazz to a new generation and more power to him for that. But at least be curious enough to check out Billy Harper. Hmm. I mean, Kamasi did it himself. He did a gig somewhere where he brought Pharoah Saunders on, on the bill too. So, I mean, bless him. But that's what I'm. That's what I'm just saying. Like you know, like it's it's it's. There's a lot of music out there, and there's a lot to there's a lot to go through. I gotta admit that. But you know, inclusion, like you okay. know, nobody's dead. <laughs> we used to talk about that with Freddie Hubbard. You know, when we we put a record out, and everybody wanted to interview Freddie, but they all they wanted to do was talk about the '60s, and Freddie would be like, "Hey, I got a new record out," you know, or they want to talk about his child problem. They want to. He's like, "Hey, you know, this is a positive day. I, I, made, I found a way to make a record anyway, and I think it's pretty good. And don't you want to talk about it?" And you know, after a while, I said, "Like, you know, after he was like, after a day of interviews, he was like, oh God, you know, it's like, I really think the mentality is, is like, isn't it great that this dead person is still alive to tell us about all this stuff?" Wow, you know, well, we've been at it for, for really about it. We've been at it for about an hour. It's very fascinating. I wanted to get one one question in, 
If you had a tune, uh, let's say you started it at the piano or something, and then you went for a walk, and you start, I don't know if you do this or not, but maybe you're arranging it in your head, thinking of the possibilities. What is the sweet spot for you as far as how many voices you have to work with? Wow, good question. I'm going to say five. That's what that's what I settled on. Um, I mean, I guess my, you know, my patter or whatever about this has changed. But there was a point where I, I, I could say, I look, I never wrote a big band chart except for my final in college. You know, it never interested me in that way. I, I like small groups. And I think the path I took and how I said I settled on octet because it was actually a Freddie Hubbard thing. Freddie, Freddie was having his chop problems. He owed a record company a record. Um, I was working with the producers and we were, you know, like ideas. And I said, well, why don't we put a slightly larger ensemble around here? Buffer, you know, he's a great composer. Buffer the material, make it sound more full. And then he just has to pick his spots, you know, which became the whole reason we did the thing. So we did we did that record and uh, that's the first time and they threw me a couple of arrangements I think Bob Belden did one or two and Bob Minzer did a couple and they threw me a couple and that's the first time I think I wrote for that size band and I liked it and that um, and that inspired me to put together that octet that plus that same production company was Young Lions time and a French company didn't have their finger on the pulse of what was going on in New York and paid us to make demos of all these young artists. And those guys like gave it to me because they didn't want to be bothered. So I produced them all. And what I walked away with, like, wow, these guys can write. There's nobody here, you know, no innovators. <laughs> There's nobody here that's like, like, oh, wow, he's, you know, great solos. Whatever. But the writing was great. And, then, and that's what I combined. I t told all those kids like, hey, I'm going to put together an octet. We'll get together every week. Just write, write whatever you want. Um, and that five was perfect. You can retain the small group thing. The, uh, uh, the material had could have much more impact when you wanted to have impact. You know, it, it just seemed like an night. I mean, I love Sextet too. Um, and well, except I guess the cookers wound up to be somewhere in the middle because it needed it needed to keep the retain. When we originally did it, it was Night of the Cookers, Night of the Cookers, two trumpets. So we had to retain the two trumpets. And then I wanted the, and I think Night of the Cookers is two trumpets and alto. And I want, you know, I wanted a little more Two trumpets and alto for an arranger. It's a little top heavy. Yeah, bright. Very... It's, it's bright, but also, I mean, the one thing I always found with the cookers or the night of the cookers and stuff like that is 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 voicings. Because, you know, the, the tendency, the, what I do with the cookers is I always put the out, if I can, is put the alto between the two trumpets. Because otherwise, you, I don't know, you're veering towards Tijuana brass on the Yeah, top. just thinking that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's it's... It's a problem, <laughs> you know, it is a problem to get get around. Um, so I, Octet, I mean, for this Wayne Shorter thing, I did eight horns, I, th I thought, and I thought that was about as much as I'd ever need um, without having to change the mindset completely into a big band thing, which I think is a whole whole other thing. I wound up writing a couple of big band charts for another Wayne Shorter project that um, Wallace Roney was doing. And it wasn't really, I guess one chart I actually had to arrange. The others were just kind of reorchestrating some things Wayne wrote. Um, but I'm going to go with five. I, re I really like that. I really like the five. And the, the three, but it is kind of a, a rangery. Um, three is, seems real natural. And, and you can make three sound as full. I mean, I'm still all, all that blue note stuff. And a book a little, book a little out front all the Wayne Shorter records, all the Art Blakey sextet records, even Freddie Hubbard sextet records, and this Slide Hampton writing for sextet. It, I think it's my favorite stuff. I think it gives you the most flexibility and most, you know, you can really make things full if you know how to voice things for three horns. Great. Study these, <laughs> study <laughs> Booker. Booker, the Slide Hampton stuff comes out more out of that Booker Little school of, of, of tight voicing. So they're, they're incredible. Well, hopefully one day they'll come out. Or... I hope that you get to that and it uh, comes to fruition.
Well, it and, looks like I got a year of, of a benefactor. You're going to yeah. hook that up, right? I'm, I'm going to work on talking that. idly. No. I started it, didn't I? <laughs> no, it's, we've had help from friends. During the yeah. pandemic, people helped us make the, get the record done. Excellent. I say that. Yeah, I mean, we're in a way, we're going back to the, that, you know, oh, what's the word for it? Benefactor, not, what was the word? Who, what, would, what did Mozart have? He had what? a patron. Patrons, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I mean, in a way, we're going back to that, right? I mean, yes, you know, we need to yeah. go fund me or whatever, you know. It's, it's well, like, I'm going to go buy a few uh, lottery tickets on the way home, and you know, you. <laughs> how many? How many million do you have to to to, to win before you think about us? About okay. seven. <laughs> okay, fair enough. It can't be the first million. I understand. That's okay. We're well, we're not unreasonable. Okay. Well, I'm hoping you can come up here and cook, and um, it's been a fascinating conversation, and I appreciate your time. Have you been talking to the other guys yet? Or you didn't? Not yet, but I will. They got I stuff, thought, too. I, I <laughs> but bet it would, they it would be, It'd be great to come up there if we can figure that out. Great. And it would be good to get, it's a school, right? The students. We can. Yep. You know, you it's always it. great for those guys to get together with the students. Indeed. So they need, uh, um, what did they call? I just did a Billy Harper we did a Billy Harper clinic, like right before COVID. And um, it was like after a cooker's tour and, and, he, and I kept him out there to do a few other things. And I did some things for him. And I I forgot, the, you know, the director of the program, I told him like, yeah, I'm gonna come along too. And he's like, what, oh, uh, um, what did I call it? Uh, a generational translator. <laughs> I had to help the kids understand what Billy Harper was telling them. <laughs> yes. In, 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 I, the con I, in the context of what they knew. I and know I was exactly joking. what you're saying. I was joking a little bit, but it really, it's really true sometimes. It's really true. It's an interesting thing. These guys are you know, enamored with these guys, but don't really see what they're saying. It, it's, it's not as clear as they hope or something like that. So they yeah. need a little bit like somebody who can re relay it to an, an iPhone or something, you know, something like that. Them. Right. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Sure, Thank you. All right. I'm going to sign off and then we'll uh, say our goodbyes. Okay. Take care.